First of all, I would like to thank Madalena and Paul for organizing this conference and for inviting me here. I'm thrilled to be part of this event. And um, as the topic resonates very much with my own research interests. Um, it is wonderful that this topic generated so much interest, which is of course uh, to a big part uh, due to the organizers efforts, it's been um, advertised. I received, I think probably 10 different emails about it from different email lists. But it was also probably partly due to the limitations imposed on us by COVID, such as being isolated, and partly by the unexpected advantages of these limitations, such as being able to attend events digitally without having to travel. Uh, still, the number of scholars and researchers present uh, surely also reflects uh, the significance and timeliness of the topic uh, for scholarship and research in general. So the Lunyu and its neighbors um, is an ambiguous title and it stimulates creative interpretations and creative approaches. As Charles was saying yesterday, it can be perceived as referring to geographical neighbors, textual neighbors, ideological, uh, or any number of other kinds of neighbors. Um, so it's wonderful to be here and see how this theme is interpreted by scholars working in different fields and periods and to see what it means to them, what the title uh, means to them. So today, as opposed to yesterday, uh, we are in the so-called medieval period later than the period with which Charles, Charles's and Chris's papers were concerned yesterday, and earlier than the imprint, imprints uh, Bryce uh, talked about. So we're, the time uh, frame is stretching from the early medieval period to the Xixia or the Song period. The Lunyu occupied such a central part in Chinese culture, it is part of the classics, more precisely, the Chinese classics, yet it circulated beyond what we normally perceive as China, beyond the contemporary borders, but also beyond the linguistic boundaries uh, where Chinese was the main language, uh, we could say primary language. To some extent, one could argue that just like the Chinese script, it was no longer a Chinese text or a Chinese classic, uh, but an East Asian text, part of a shared culture. There was, of course, also a shared body of Buddhist scriptures written in Chinese, yet used throughout East Asia and even parts of Central Asia. Uh, so the motivations behind this phenomenon are uh, extremely interesting. As was mentioned yesterday, we often associate the Lun Yu with the highly literate elite, at least when we think of it as a transmitted text. Uh, this kind of reading and use of the text is also central to Andrew Meyer's examination. Um, of the Lun Yu and its connection to early Xuanxie scholarship. He points out that the that most received editions of the Lun Yu go back to the Lun Yu Jijie, collated by He Yan, uh, from three or more earlier editions into a single edition. Xuanxie is, of course, closely associated with Taoist texts. Um, it as a movement, intellectual movement, it elevated the status of the Laozi, using it as its core text. While after the Wei, uh, the three texts known collectively as Sanxue were the Laozi, the Zhou Yi, and the Zhuangzi. In the early period for Wang Bi, the Lun Yu was one of the main texts um, instead of the Zhuangzi. Wang Bi wrote a commentary to the Lun Yu and also the Laozi and the Zhou Yi and nothing else. Uh, he interprets the text in a typical Xuanxie manner, um, kind of uh, framing Confucius's words as advocating Xuanxie concepts. Um, as Andrew says, Wang Bi is turning Confucius himself into a Xuanxie exegete. Uh, but Wang Bi goes beyond Confucius's words and also portrays him um, his person as embodying Xuanxie principles. So in his persona and his actions. 
Andrew also suggests that um, what the early Xuanxue scholars were trying to do was to elevate the Lunyu, placing it in line with the Laozi and the Zhou Yi, raising it to the uh, status of a canon, which of course involved fixing the text. So um, if I understand his meaning correctly, then he's suggesting that uh, this kind of um, endeavor actually is uh, to a large extent responsible to um, our current version of the text, the received version of the Lunyu. So he also suggests that um, basically the Lunyu was not only formed during the Han, but then also after the Han. And so especially since the editions we have today, they stem from an edition that was compiled after the Han. And I, I find this in, uh, idea intriguing and uh, important not only for the status of the text in different periods, but also for its function um, in those periods. Uh, Chris Nugent is doing something quite the opposite, um, looking at it, how the text was used, reused, maybe recycled or quoted in a popular uh, primer which did not even make it as a transmitted text. Uh, nevertheless, it su survived in multiple copies in the Dunhuang Library Cave. Uh, these copies were not transmitted, but excavated. Um, so in a way, this is a chance discovery and we get an almost random slice of what was available at the time. In many senses, it is also a more representative slice than transmitted literature at least from the point of view of um, sort of the community who was producing and using these texts or these manuscripts. This shifts, uh, this shifts the focus from the text to the user and function. Um, the main point is not what the text says or even how the text changes, but what its function was for people, uh, for the people who copied and read it. So the important questions are, why were they copying it? Why were they quoting from it? Why the Lunyu, or rather, why the Lunyu too? Because they were obviously other texts, but the Lunyu in this particular Zhou Jing talk, um, the Lunyu was the most prominent source for quotes. It is intriguing to see that some of the quotes are imprecise and manifest some textual variation when viewed against the received version of the, of the Lunyu. While such variants may stem from different editions, which may be ascertained when examining the Lunyu manuscripts from Dunhuang and Turfan, um, a future task, uh, task uh, Chris uh, said he was going to do. I think it's also possible that at least some of them come not from the Lunyu, but from earlier primers or encyclopedias. In other words, they don't come from the elite, from elite an elite corpus of texts. And I suspect that some quotes were transmitted as quotes already, often along with the variant readings separately from the Lun Yu as an independent text. The Zhou Jing Chao copies examined uh, by Chris are, or all, or most of them, come from 9th, 10th century Dunhuang, when the region was no longer part of the Tang Empire or not even part of the Chinese realm. And while most manuscripts from this period are Chinese, at least 40% of them are in other languages, most importantly Tibetan, but also quite a few other languages. So by this time, even more than before, this was a multilingual and multicultural region. And this connects to Nikita Kuzmin's talk. Um, and Nikita examined the situation in the Tangut state which was um, in a similar geographical location, slightly to the northeast of Dunhuang, um, as most texts come from the side of Karakoto in Inner Mongolia, but also overlapping with Dunhuang, as the Hoxi region, including Dunhuang, was conquered by the Tanguts in the mid, mid 11th century and remained part of the Xixia state for a century and a half until the Mongol conquest. The material we see there 
uh, to some extent is part of elite culture. The Tango translation of the Lumio is, for example, a printed text. And it's a kind of, it's not a popular print, but it's, it's a very well uh, executed um, printing. The Tanguts were making, um, as Nikita was saying, the Tanguts were making official requests for the classics on a state level. They were petitioning the Sun court uh, to send them books. Yet the texts we see today are also excavated. Um, they come from a similar setting as the ones from Tunhuang. Most of them come from inside a stupa uh, in Karakoto, uh, which was a burial ground. And the texts were interred together uh, with the body, with a body. And we should remember that the Tunhuang Library Cave also contained a statue of a monastic person called Pianhong. He was the leader of the local Buddhist community in the second half of the ninth century. And the statue in the back had a niche uh, which contained his ashes. So you could also um, look at uh, the library cave as a burial um, site. So this kind of burial of text uh, along with somebody has important implications for understanding the nature of the texts or the collections, both in Tunhuang and Karakoto. By focusing um, on the Tangut material, Nikita steps outside the realm of Chinese language and looks at how the text operated, the Lunyu operated in another language. There are, of course, a great number of interesting textual questions here, such as how did they translate the text? What words did they use for technical terminology? After all, terms such as zhen and yi were well established within Chinese written culture, but would have had would have been entirely unfamiliar in another language. But even more exciting is the question: why translate the Lun Yu? And why translate the Xiao Jing and the Arya? What did the Tanguts derive from it? What was the point? Um, this is surely more than interest or more than intellectual interest. Um, and we cannot fail to notice that there must be political um, motives and political consequences uh, behind these translations. Uh, the translation of um, such text shows that they had a function that went beyond the immediate message contained in them, such as if we think of the Lunyu as the discussion, a record of the discussions of Confucius with his disciples. Uh, they were potent texts that the Tanguts needed to have. To answer these questions, we should also remember that the Tanguts translated a great many other texts, such as legal texts, military texts, uh, medical treatises, encyclopedias, and even the Jiujing Chao Chris talked about. Also, that many of these texts were translated not only by the Tanguts, but by other peoples around China, other neighbors, the Uyghurs, the Khitans, the Jurchen, or not really neighbors, such as the Mongols and the Manchu. In sum, uh, these three talks offer new ways of engaging with the Lunyu during the medieval period. Um, there have been a number of comments and questions in the chat window already. So, I am very much looking forward to a stimulating discussion on them. Thank you. Thank you so much for this wrapping up. Um, okay, let's start with questions for Andrew. I see Professor Sturks and Professor Hunter have a similar question. So I would invite them both maybe to raise their points and Andrew, you can then respond to both of them. Oh, uh, thank you very much. And, and thank you, Andrew, for, you know, for your paper. Um, I just wanted to say that that particular example, you know, of, of, of the, the J didn't strike me as, as very persuasive one if you wanted to sort of have the, uh, you know, the Xuan Shui folk uh, sort of extol correlative thought as something, you know, that, that that's that's also part of their menu. That was all I, you know, for me, that was more a passage which, which 
you know, which is more like a <clears throat> an analogy or a, it comes close to a sing or a B, right? Which you see across, you know, across multiple texts uh, in the Warring States period. But I was actually m curious how, you know, how how he dealt with a passage, for example, such as, you know, 15.5 in the Analects, where you have Wu, Wu Wei or Jirji, right? Shun is the guy who Wu Wei's and yet, and yet rules. So I would have thought that's the sort of, one that they might have, but I don't know, you know, I don't know the text well enough. Uh, <clears throat> but that's all I wanted to, I, I wanted to, to, to say to that. Well, I mean, I, let me just clarify that. And I, and I know I was sort of rushing at the end, so I, w I was not clear. You know, what I think He Yen and his group were up to was uh, eliminating that kind of material from the Analects. So these extra chapters, the, the Qi Lun Yu is lost. And it's lost largely thanks to the activities of, of He Yan's um, uh, committee. And I, and I think that if, if, if uh, Zhang Zhantao is right, and that was uh, a passage from the, the Qi Lun Yu, I think that exemplifies why they wanted to jettison it, because it's much more amenable to the kind of uh, exegetical maneuvers being done by somebody like Dong Zhangshu and Jing Fang than it would be to, you know, does it have to be, um, uh, does it have to be uh, interpreted in, in light of correlative cosmology? No, but it's much more easily, you know, interpretable in light of correlative cosmology than in light, than, than, than it would be amenable to um, the, um, the exegetical project of somebody like Wang Bi, you know, so um, it would be very, very difficult to take that passage and do Wang Bi's treatment on it and say, oh, well, this proves the importance of Wu over Yo. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an entirely Yo passage. <laughs> it's talking about all of the tangible qualities of Jade. Um, so, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I just, it, to me, it's, it, it exemplifies if, again, if Zhang Zhantao is right. Now, your other question is an interesting one. Unfortunately, most of Wang Bi's commentary is lost. Now, we can look at other other um, early medieval fragments of early medieval commentaries. We, we can look at Huang uh, Khan's uh, issue for, for that kind of question, but um, I haven't yet and I would have to. It's a good question. Yeah, if I could, if I could follow up. Um, <clears throat> as a rule, I'm very open to the possibility, of, as we all have to be, that you know, the boundaries of texts are fluid um, in the early period and beyond. Um, and we don't have to look any further than an example like the Mengzi, right? Zhao Qi tells us when he puts together his Mengzi commentary, I've left some things out because I don't think they fit, right? So we have that model staring us in the face. I think the problem I'm having with your theory that you're laying out, Andy, is that I, there's just so many obstacles to including the Lunyu in that conversation in the third century CE um that I'd, I'd like to hear you address so well for example so i'm much more comfortable seeing that the boundaries of the analects are in flux in the in the first century bce with all these manuscript finds um you know say from sima tian to wang mong say i think i it's seeing flux makes sense but then you read the iwen jir and what is what does that say it says there's this diversity of commentarial traditions um that then sort of come to an end because the version of Zhang yu wins out then what do we see in Eastern Han? We've got the stone classics, and the Lunyu is being enshrined in stone. We've got Zhengshuan's commentary. We have this amazing, um, uh, this huge quotation practice where when people are quoting the Analects, they're, they're quoting something that looks a lot like our Analects. There's not much variation. And maybe you want to say those are retrospectively normalized, and that's a fair point. But nevertheless, you have a huge practice and rhetoric of, of um, that seem to support a stable text. Not to mention, when you look at the, the, the Lunyu Jijie, um, you know, there's not much of a, of a, not many hints in that text of different texts that earlier commentators were working with. You know, when you look at the Maoshu Zheng Yi, for example, they'll note that, say, the Maoshu uh, arrangement was different from Zheng Shuren's arrangement in a few different spots, you know, which, which shows that between the Maoshu and, and Zheng Shuren, there was some real difference in, in the kind of text they were using. But I don't really see, unless I'm missing something fundamental, I don't see that kind of um, awareness of difference when it comes to the Jing um, in, in He Yen's compilation. So uh, my feeling is that the Lunyu was already so central, was already referred to as among the seven classics in the, by the Eastern Han period, that there was less wiggle room for a group of motivated compilers 
to, to monkey around with the boundaries of the text for the Lunyu than say for other corpora. Well, I'm following, I'm following He Yan's uh, preface, which says that there are these, and you do get um, reports that there are these different editions. So you know, what's possible in that is that by the East, by the Eastern Han, what we've got are three stable texts, right? We've got a Lu Lun Yu, a Gu Lun Yu, and a Qi Lun Yu. Um, and that what He Yan and his uh, committee are able to do is collate them into one authoritative Lun Yu um, and, and sort of establish that, okay, from this point forward, um, uh, these are gonna be the parameters of the text that these extra chapters that are part of the um, the the chi lun you are now no longer going to be um, no longer going to be consulted as authoritative. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, to a certain extent, the fact that that he Yan's uh, version is the one that is is sort of appropriated and adopted uh, and survives, uh, I think, testifies to to the 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 sense that they accomplished something, that they, they contributed something that, that um, the general field of, of textual production seemed to um, respond to in terms of a perceived need for uh, a, a st the stability of the text. No? Or, or the stability of the commentary. I mean, I, I mean, I see it as basically a precursor to the Zhongyi project, right? That, that it's, you know, with the Zhongyi project, it's not as much about establishing the text as it is about establishing how we think about the text by culling earlier voices and picking the good ones and discarding the ones. So, so I'd be much more inclined to focus on that sort of at the commentarial level, that that was the real achievement of the, of the Lunar DTA as opposed to... I, I wouldn't um, disagree, but I mean, the thing is that the at this point in, in sort of the intellectual history, the text and the commentary aren't really separable, right? Um, if you want that, if you want the text to have a certain form, uh, for the purposes of, you know, obviously, you do have things like the Stone Classics, but, uh, but if you, but but for the purposes of um, literati who are working with these texts to various ends, you you really can't work with a text absent a commentarial, you know, absent the shape given to it by a, by by the commentary, so, you know. Uh, fixing fixing the commentary and fixing the text aren't really separable endeavors. That, that's what I would argue anyway. That's, that's... Professor Golden, do you want to add something and or tell us how much you hate neodalism? Oh, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry, I forgot I was muted. Um, I have a question for um, Christopher Nugent, and I see that Misha uh, Tad has a follow-up question. So let's let uh, Misha go first. Sure. Um, okay, so I, just in defense of Andy a little bit, um, and I do think his, I do think his his um, hypothesis is speculative, but. There are some points that, that might support it more. Um, for one, the, the Qi Lun Yu is from Qi, right? And what do we associate with Qi and the, the intellectual culture of Qi, but the Jisha Academy. And the Jisha Academy is really the, the origin of this correlative cosmology um, trend that goes into the early part of the Han. And so, I mean, maybe that passage doesn't have to, that, that you quoted um, about the jade doesn't have to be read in a correlative cosmological way, but if it, it can be, and that supports a more correlative cosmological worldview that was quite popular in Qi, um, that might make sense that that's why it was in that particular version coming from that particular place. Um, in regard to the question of the fix, the fixity or you know, the, the closed nature of the Luni by the, the time of the juncture period, I, I mean, we don't have, you know, totally 
firm evidence either way. And I do think, for example, the Zhuangzi gets completely re-edited in that Trinxia period. Um, you have a, originally have a much longer Zhuangzi and then it's cut down quite a lot um, by Guoxiang. And that becomes the transmitted received edition of the text. Um, so it, it could be that that whole period, this sort of thing is happening generally um, with an establishment of these authoritative versions of the text that then get become our received editions. I mean, of course, not necessarily across the board, but that that's something that is happening. And even if there were earlier Han sort of standard editions, those could be reformulated um, in the period. And maybe that, that the example of Guoxiang leads more credence to Andy's theory. Um, Andy, think... maybe before you respond, also take Gil Raz's question. Okay, Gil, what were you gonna say? Well, my, 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 my question is not so much about the analects per se, but what about the category Xuanxue itself? Mm -hmm. um, because you start off by saying that the, the Lunijizia doesn't quite conform to what our expectations are of Xuanxue. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not quite sure what our expectations, what our expectations are of Xuanxue. Um, you know, you know, New Dalsen doesn't, really, doesn't really make sense at all, but, um, you know, there was just this recent volume that came out, you probably saw it, um, about the Xuan Shui that just came out to Dao Companion to it. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, if you, so when I received um, the instructions for writing in it, they were so, in some way they were vague, but it was, they were vague in a, in a good way to sort of say, you know, all of these people could be, could be Xuan Shui. And I was assigned to work with Gershuan, who's never actually put in a Gershuan category at all. And I'm, I'm, I was happy to write about Gershuan. Um, so it really depends, first of all, what you include in Xuan Xue. So I think one way to sort of reframe the question is not whether, um, um, you know, the Lunyu TJ, you know, reforms the Lunyu itself as much as the project that Huyen specifically is doing, not as part of a Xuan Xue uh, category, but what he in fact is himself doing. Um, and constructing their particular particular vision of what the orthodoxy should be. And that orthodoxy is this orthodoxy and includes this particular version of, as you say, already established, or has already established um, canonic, some form Lunyu with a particular canonic version of, of um, its commentaries, plus, you know, some canonic version of the Laozi, plus some canonic version of So establishing a very particular canonic version um, that we, in the retrospect, call it Xuan Shui, um, and then try and fit. What does it? How does it fit with Wang Bi? How does it fit with you know, Pei Wei? How does it fit with you know Guo Xiang? But they, they themselves were not necessarily thinking in in those terms. Um. I, I, so those are two very different. Questions. Yeah, I didn't realize they'd be. So. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I generally agree with, with Misha. I, I think that the, um, you know, I, I don't know if the Qi Lunyu actually was geographically associated with Qi, but certainly that label does suggest that whoever was promulgating a, a Qi version of the text was interested in these kind of correlative cosmological um, ideas. Um, and that was one way of sort of, um, telegraphing that um, by, by calling it a Qi Lunyu. In terms of Gil, I mean, what Gil's saying, yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily disagree. Shran Shri, I think it's, it's, been, it's been poorly understood and I haven't really had a chance to take a careful look at the Tao companion volume, um, you know, in the pandemic. Uh, they tend to be expensive. I'm gonna have to um, shell, out, shell out some money, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the Shran Shran movement, obviously, um, I, I think that it, it becomes very complicated over time. Uh, a lot of different kinds of streams flow into it. Um, but I agree with John Makem that, you know, to, to, to refer to some of Gill's scholarship, right, if we, if, we, if, we, if we were to think of a sort of a family of different sort of um, uh, characteristics, um, four or five different characteristics that um, typify Shran Shui, uh, 
Um, the Lin Yu Jijia has none of them. <laughs> right? um, they're just not there. Uh, and I, I think that 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 may well have been deliberate on the part of He Yan right, and his committee to say, well, this is a nonpartisan uh, articulation of the text. We are not putting forward. We believe that this text um, uh, is very efficacious and con contains great wisdom and can be interpreted um, in very particular ways, but we're not married to sort of promoting our interpretation of the text. Rather, we are out to promote uh, what can be accepted to triangulate the most consensual version of the text that we can arrive at so that moving forward, we can all work with it and we can all um, use it as a focus of interpretation. That's my idea of what's going on. I don't know if that, if that's persuasive, Gil. Well, it's, it's persuasive. My, 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 my main issues is simply in, in, in having expectations about the category of Xuan, having particular expectations about what Xuan Shui authors would be doing. Well, I think, I think it's particular to the period we're looking at. Yeah. Certainly moving from the juncture era on, Xuan Shui becomes a much more complicated phenomenon. There's no doubt about that. And lots of different streams flow into it. And, and there are lots of complicated um, uh, ramifications of it. Yeah. Right. Maybe Keith Knapp's question, and then I think we should probably move on to questions on the other papers. Actually, I was going to ask a question about uh, the other papers, if that's OK. Yes, yes, let's move to Then we can always circle back at this time. OK. So actually, uh, well, all three papers were great. And uh, thank you very much for sp sponsoring this and making it available through uh, the virtual format to, to all of us. Uh, uh, that's particularly valuable for us who are at small institutions and would, would otherwise would never have this sort of access. Uh, uh, so, Mike, uh, of course, I was uh, really arrested by uh, Chris Nugent's talk, and uh, I, I want to have a question for him. And, uh, you know, we know from uh, uh, Six Dynasties uh, anecdotes that the usual uh, texts that, that uh, people learned literacy through were the, uh, the Xiao Jing and the Lun Yu. And, uh, and so uh, if I gathered what you were saying correctly, uh, that by, by at least the, uh, the, the mid to late Tang, that, uh, that actually uh, something like the Zhou Jing Chao is actually aimed at, at literati. And so that you sort of bypass the uh, Lun Yu and, and the Xiao Jing and, and that you know these texts not through uh, memorizing those two texts, but rather uh, through these uh, sort of uh, uh, primers. Uh, and so I want to make sure that I got, uh, am I right? Is, is that what you were saying? And then, uh, all right, if, if that's not correct, uh, uh, then also there's a question about audience. I mean, for me, uh, it would seem that, uh, that maybe this is aimed at a slightly less uh, erudite audience, maybe for people who, who need a, uh, a, a, a basic literacy. And they need to know something about uh, ideas proposed in the Analects, but, but they don't necessarily need it uh, to be where they can quote it or where, where they need to have a uh, precise knowledge of the text. You know, so maybe you serve merchants or uh, 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 townsmen uh, of that level. So, so those are my two questions, whether I got your characterization right and whether perhaps uh, a, a text like this, the Zhou Jingchao is, is actually aimed towards a slightly less elevated audience. So um, Chris, if I may, I have a pretty similar question. So maybe, sure. maybe you can, um, um, like in pinball, when you get a free ball and you <laughs> end up doing both balls at the same time. Um, so, uh, I'll have another theory, just like yesterday, and then you tell me whether whether you think it holds water, and if not, why not? Um, and the theory is that this is the the, the pattern that you find uh, is very very interesting, um, and and I'm completely persuaded. 
but I don't think it's all that strange or even all that different from the pattern for other types of um, uh, miscellanies or, 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 or rudimentary instruction texts. Um, the, uh, the, the, the Lunyu Yue, by the way, seems to me in every example you showed where there would be some portion that uh, hues closely to the received text of the Lunyu and then it diverges, the portion that's the close parallel comes first. So maybe Lunyu Yue is really just the opening. And then that provides an opportunity for the compiler to drift off in um, whatever he or the committee or the tradition feels is a related direction. Maybe some of those quotes are spliced together from other texts that are now lost, or maybe those are, you know, just um, um, proverbs or, or 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 other kinds of, um, again, rudimentary uh, um, uh, dictates that um, seemed to the compiler to be relevant when focusing on that particular passage of the Analect. Uh, people who know about Buddhist texts from Dunhuang can speak more authoritatively than I can. The, the pattern strikes me as being pretty similar. This looks like it's meant for the instruction of people who don't have, you know, literati education, don't have an encyclopedic knowledge um, of the sources, and maybe the teachers don't either. Um, and the main idea is to inculcate values and ground them in um, canonical sources and not be all that scrupulous about whether you're quoting the canonical sources accurately, since that's not really the purpose for, 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 for the audience involved. The purpose is to um, convey, uh, convey the values and make sure they understand that. Maybe if they graduate, they can go on to study uh, the text graph by graph, uh, but, but not at this stage. I guess my, my short answer to that would be yes. I mean, I, I do think like you're, the situation you're describing there is generally the, the situation that I, I think we have, that this is not at all an uncommon way uh, for texts like this. To, when I say texts like this, I mean the Analects and other classical texts to be dealt with in a textual and pedagogical context in the long medieval period. And in fact, I would say it's ex an extremely common way for them That's to be sense. dealt with. And I'll, in my answer, I mean, I, actually, I think I'll end up answering some of the questions that came up in the, in the chat that are related. So as I, as I kind of go through this, uh, Imre alluded to this with the question of whether or not people who are compiling these mengshu leishu are in fact working from other previous Mengshu and Leishu. And I think the answer to that is also absolutely yes. In fact, the more of these I read, the more I feel that it's Leishu all the way down, basically, that uh, those are what they're primarily using. And I think that's not only the case in these, you know, what we might call somewhat lower level Leishu that we find at Dunhuang, it's also the case with the Chu Shiji, which is clearly built on the Iwan Leiju. I mean, it, it excerpts Fu with exactly the same lines removed that they were removed from the Iwan Leiju. So I think this is a very common practice, even among Lei Shu compilers who had access to the full imperial library and really did not need to look at a, a previous Lei Shu for their quotes from the Linyu. But I think they did. And I mean, the answer I think is, one, it's easier. Uh, someone else has already said, these are the important parts that you need to know. Uh, and two, it's easier because they're more likely to have those physical texts with them in many cases than they are likely to have a full library of the right. physical text from which they're drawn, which is difficult to, difficult to get for almost everybody. Uh, even after the widespread use of paper. Um, and I can segue a little bit from that in, into Keith's question. Actually, before I do that, your question about do they start out with a quote from Lunyu and then diverge? Uh, more often than not, but not always. So one, one exception that I, that I mentioned earlier uh, 
is there's a passage, an entry that starts out Lun Yu Yun, and then it's uh, it's Sui Zao Xiong Nian, Fu Mu Bu Zhi, and then it's followed by Fu Mu Zai Bu Yuan Yong, and, and so forth. But most of the longer ones, they start with a Lun Yu passage, and the divergence is more later on in the text. But to get to Keith's related question, so I think when we see Lun Yu and the uh, Xiao Jing mentioned as the text that, uh, that precocious children and other people are memorizing early on, a lot of those biographies are from people at the very high end of even the literate strata of, uh, of society. Say nothing of obviously at the high end of the society overall. And I think those are the kind of things you point out in biographies. You know, you don't you don't say in a biography of a scholar official that when he was young he managed to read C spot go run spot run, right? You you mention that he memorized the first book of Genesis or the uh, or you know Hamlet's soliloquy because that's what's that's what's interesting and, and meaningful and, and shows that person is special. So my guess, and it really is a guess, it's a speculation because people don't write about using these in most cases, but my guess is indeed as you characterized it, that I think a large portion of the literate segment of society is learning its classical texts, uh, their classical texts from works like this. And as Paul pointed out, in most contexts, that's fine. That's enough. Uh, you're, you, you, you rarely run into contexts in which you have to reproduce large portions of classical text precisely unless you're taking the Mingjing exam. And you, know, and you have a very, very small portion of the literate population who's doing that. Or writing a high-level Zhang Jing exactly, commentary. Exactly. Like you're that. far more likely to encounter situations where you're composing poetry at a party or you're having a conversation with friends and you know nobody is, is checking the accuracy of your quotes. And what you're doing is alluding to passages. You're not quoting them precisely. And so that act of illusion, it, you know, it's it's a it's a form of compression, right? You compress a larger textual amount into something small and you use that and the act of decompression is put on the audience who is supposed to recognize that and recognize the larger context, but they don't know what's actually lost in that compression in your mind, right? They're not gonna know whether you remember all of that text. Just like if I you know, mention slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, you have no idea whether I know the whole soliloquy or not. I don't for the record, but, uh, but so I, I think that's how these are functioning and they're perfectly serviceable in, uh, you know, for that function. Uh, so I think that they work that way a lot. And Misha's question also is along similar lines. I think you see the recycling of these lines all over the place. Um, the question about whether we see the same thing with the Shangshu quotes and the Lao Tzu quotes, I just don't know because I haven't checked all of those yet. So I'm not sure. My guess would be yes. But, um, but again, I, I don't know for sure. Um, I, think I, I feel like an imposter because I don't know enough about Buddhism, but I, I, I remember in grad school reading that Paul Demiaville um, was looking at similar Buddhist sorts of texts from Don Huang that are also uh, culling uh, famous, uh, famous lines. And if I remember correctly, so two steps, if I remember correctly that that's what the paper was about, and do I remember correctly that that's what the result was, but I think so. It's a very similar pattern, that it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be exactly right. You can mix a bunch of things together uh, because the purpose is to, um, um, you know, the purpose is to convey the supposed meaning rather than, rather than fixating on, on the, um, the literal text. I can find the reference. I see two follow-ups by um, Professor Samt and Professor Allen. You're welcome to yeah, chime so, in. Yeah, so Chris, I, I, 
that, that's really interesting stuff. And I was actually sort of going to offer a comment if I could. I, I totally agree that we're talking about an illusion, but I wonder uh, in these cases where people are alluding to the loan, you, I almost wonder if we could separate that from the issue of whether or not the audience n knew or need needed to know, because um, it seems like to me, and here I'm thinking again, cross-culturally, like we did yesterday when you brought up medieval studies. So I'm sorry to be boring, but this is my current hobby horse. Um, the, um, we see it in European manuscript tr traditions also, where actually the more important the text is, the more likely you are to, to summarize and, as you say, compress and to, in fact, deviate from the exact wording. Um, and that's not dependent on the audience and their need to know. Uh, and almost it seems to me to be, I, I wonder what you think, it might be the opposite, that you know your audience knows this, right? And that because they're already familiar with it, you, you can then play fast and loose with the words. And I'm thinking of here in the, maybe you know, like the uh, manuscripts of, uh, there's a very famous manuscript of the Rule of St. Benedict, where the copyists, Tato and Grimmel, uh, marked in the, in the margins uh, all the places where his Latin was not classical because he was a speaking Italian. He's not writing Latin proper, proper. Um, but deviations from the Bible don't bother them at all, that sort of thing. So I, I wonder what, what, that's more of a comment than a question. But. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean, I think um, I don't know if I would say the deviations from the Linu in this case, like that they would think it doesn't matter. Uh, it may be more that they're just not paying close attention to it uh, because, again, they're recycling passages that were quoted in earlier Mengshu and Leishu. So I'm not 100% sure, but I but I but I do know what you're saying in terms of a social context in which these texts are going to be referred to, I think it's very much the case that, you know, you point towards a passage that you assume that, that everybody knows. The same way you point to, you know, if you're composing poetry, you point to a line from a foo that everybody knows. And one of the nice things that texts like this do for readers and users is that, you know, they, when you're telling the reader, these are the important things to know, you're not just saying for your own edification to be a learned person, you should know these things. You're also saying, these are the things you can expect other learned people to know. So these are the things that are safe to allude to. And that can be useful in context ranging from composing a poem uh, in a social context with your superiors to writing a lusher on the exam, when you, you, you want to have illusions that maybe are clever enough, but not too clever, because if your examiners don't get the illusion, that's not a good thing. And so, and that's another reason why this is a sort of a circular thing, that the more everybody is using the same, uh, the same passages, the more important those passages become for those contexts. So it's it's sort of sort of self-fulfilling. Um, and I think that's some of what's going on with these. And, and Andy's writing there in, in the, uh, the comments, a, a dictionary of cultural literacy. Absolutely. That's, that's absolutely what it is. These are the things you need to know to become a, you know, to pass as a literate, not, I shouldn't say pass as a literate person, to function in this literate context. So to get back to Keith's question about the, the social level, I think, yes, these are not, these are not texts that someone like Wang Wei needs to use to learn the cultural tradition because being a Taiyuan Wang and growing up in, in the context he grows up in, he, the upper class of the upper class, he probably you know, has learned these illusions in different contexts. But you have a large group of people, especially once you get to the, you know, the high and mid Tang who, um, who are in that class but don't have that same they're not, not necessarily training for the exam, but they're existing in a context where they're around a lot of other literate people. And this is a way to get to know these things. I don't think this isn't, these are not for farmers. I think in most cases, they're not for merchants. They're for members of that larger uh, literate class. Uh, just one other quick comment I want to make, because I think Madalena asked in the chat if any of these sneak in from commentaries. And the answer is yes, there are some 
uh, passages attributed to the Lanyu that are actually from the Zhengshan commentary. So they, they do sneak in. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, the Professor Alan, would you like to? Oh, I also saw Wolfgang had two comments. One has been resolved in the chat. Um, he could tell us a bit about Greek yeah, classics. Yeah, yeah. The, the comment in the chat was not in order to be snarky, but I was just too slow to catch whether in the manuscript um, there was this mistake or whether it was just uh, a processing area. On, I think on, it was, on... yeah, it was just the, the processing yeah, yeah. area, sorry. Um, so, <laughs> no, because it, it is interesting to look at the typology of errors which do occur in these manuscripts. And uh, I was wondering about, um, writing upon dictation, whether that is a mode in which some of these manuscripts are uh, produced or whether it's more a copying problem. And then you were mentioning at one point that Bushan gets replaced by uh, in some instances. So it's more a semantic kind of thing and, and less based on uh, um, kinds of mistakes which uh, arise uh, in the conditions of, of orality and, and dictation. And that was interesting for me. But the other point was just similarly, uh, just a, a remark uh, following up on what Paul had asked about the similarity of uh, the situation with Buddhist texts. And I extended that into the Mingqing situation where you have these Jesuit translations. And then uh, people try to reconstruct what kind of version of Euclid uh, or Aristotle that people used. And it, it inevitably turns out that they used these very lousy primers, which were uh, the primers of their youth when they were trained in Coimbra and other places in Portugal. So you, you could even extend the kind of typology uh, you had and which uh, already was mentioned that the more important the text, um, the less uh, reliable that kind of texts get um, in, in those situations in the outskirts of an, of an empire uh, or in the outskirts of a, a translational uh, activity. So unlike in the case of say, the Tibetans uh, who were developing techniques for rendering Sanskrit into Tibetan in a way that you could then reconstruct Sanskrit originals from and, and uh, which had been transferred into Tibetan. In all those cases where the manuscripts traveled um, um, uh, in, in, in the Jesuit translation process, that didn't happen. It, and it's somewhat similar to the situation that you described for, for Dunhuang. So it was just a remark um, uh, to extend that theme a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, so the variants are of, of all sorts. And these texts were clearly reproduced not only uh, by looking at a written exemplar, but also by listening to somebody else's dictation. There are colophons that say student so-and-so, uh, you know, song, well, student so-and-so shu. And so there's somebody reciting and somebody writing. Uh, many of them obviously written exemplar to written exemplar. The variations are uh, again of all sorts. So the closer the words are phonetically and the closer the characters are orthographically, the more common your, uh, that variation is going to be. So mean, you know, what and river though obviously unrelated semantically and clearly mistakes in almost any imaginable context are constantly switched back and forth. So when you have both, when you have orthographic similarity and, and phonetic similarity, those mistakes are ubiquitous and you can sort of move down the line. So lots and lots of, of all of those as, as Imre knows well. Thank you. Professor Allen. Um, it seems like we're sort of forgetting what we what we heard yesterday and when we were talking today about the fluidity of the Lenu in later times, because in Chris's talk, when he's talking about uh, the use of the Lenu in construction, that seems to imply that uh, people memorized the Lenu, and it even suggests that it was so well memorized that people could use it as a counting device. And those, I mean, Chris can correct me if I'm wrong, but those quotes seem, they, you know, that all seem to be in the order that we are used to. So it may have, there may have been a loss of that in later times, if you're talking about Dunhuang manuscripts, but at least in the Han, in terms of creating this cultural 
unity, or, or, or at least the, the, what I, I agree very much with Chris, this is the sort of thing that people should know. But it seems likely that even the Lunyu, and Chris also mentioned that the Lunyu was um, uh, replaced the, the Sons of Pien in other texts as the thing that was quoted. So that suggests it was used as a, as a memorized by people learning to write, at least for a period of time. So if that's so, to put in other things, uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to imagine uh, in terms of adding things to the text. So I'm going to, I mean, I, my, my question was a little while back, but I wanted to say it anyway. Maybe Chris would like to respond. Which Chris? Chris Foster. Okay. <laughs> Chris, do you want to? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, a great question. Um, and it's interesting too with the ceiling inscriptions. I mean, obviously we have a small sample size. So perhaps if we find more data, there'll be more variations and some of this won't play out. Um, but uh, a point that I was actually talking to Madalina about um, after the conference is that all of these inscriptions too come from the beginning of Zhang. Um, so the Lun Yu quote, it's, it's, it's small, it's a, a sort of a complete passage in and of itself, but the uh, sections from the Xiao Jing, for instance, either come from the very beginning of the work as we know it from the received text, or from the beginning of different Zhang, um, even though the Zhang can be quite long. Uh, the Ji Jiu Pian, uh, same thing, same situation. Um, so that really just suggests to me that these are being used as counting devices. I mean, you think if, uh, if we were to use an alphabet, right, you start with the ABC. Um, or more rarely you go to the end of the alphabet, X, Y, Z, you never start in the middle. Um, and that's exactly what we're seeing with the ceiling. Um, but I think part of the conversation that we're, we were just having about the function of these, these later primers in, in Dunhong too, is that it's, it's about cultural literacy. And I think it's interesting to think that, um, you know, moving out of the order actually is a way of displaying cultural literacy, like being able to break apart the text and put it together and, and, more interesting ways demonstrates a sort of mastery. Um, and I think that may be one of the keys moving forward is looking at, you know, so what is the sort of logic of these different variations that we're seeing um, in this later lay shoe and primer? Like, why are these different sections getting sort of, you know, put on together like Frankenstein's monster? Um, and also, what is the relationship of the entries too, right? Like, so why, why is the Luni quoted and then the Shangshu and then something else? Are they sharing a certain value? Is it just teaching talking points? Is it just teaching language? I think you know that's a, a big piece of the puzzle. Um, but yeah, no, thank you for, for bringing that up, Sarah. That's a really good point. Thank you. Yeah, it was um, something that we touched upon and by uh, Ima. Uh, but does um, Chris Nugent want to respond also? I, I feel like um, Sarah Allen's question was really toward both Chris's. Yeah, it was. I'll do it very quickly. I, I think that uh, I think that the existence of you know, as I said, of all these these primers shows that certainly there are a lot of people who have not memorized the Lunyu. Uh, you know, there's no market to some extent if everybody's uh, running around with the Lunyu in their head. Uh, but again, I'm talking about a much a much later period, so. Uh, and, and a much larger, much, much larger uh, literate population with the, the broad definition of literate that we've been using. Um, so I, I think part of that is just a, a change over time and expansion of literacy and a broadening of the nature of the, the literate population as well. That's my guess. Uh, just to quickly respond to what Chris asked, um, the, the preface to uh, uh, Zhou Jing Chao actually does talk about it being for moral instruction, excerpting the most important works. You know, it's, it's a lot of the usual types of blossoms and gems and whatnot to, um, to give them to you in a compact format so that you can be a good moral actor because that's what these texts teach you to do. So that's why those are the ones that are in here. There are other primers that have uh, have different aims and focus more on education and knowing what to say in the right context, but that's not brought up in the, the preface to this one. 
Okay. Um, we can go with Jing Feng's question to Nikita, and then Brian also had one. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi, Nikita. Yeah, I have a question hi. about. Oh, yeah, I have a question about your last, your final slide of your PowerPoint. It's like there are two prints, and one of them are the four beauties. And I, I just want to know, uh, know more about the context where they were, like the context of which they were used, and uh, or their functions. Like, yeah, thank you. Yeah, Fongjin, thank you for your question. It's a really interesting one. Uh, even though the, the purpose why I used this uh, slide was quite diff uh, quite uh, <laughs> other, but but anyway, I mean, um, there is an article by uh, Tangut Art Specialist Kira Samasyuk. He works in Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, and I remember reading her article on this those two uh, prints. And as far as I remember, if I remember correctly, they are supposed to be drama posters. Um, how they ended up there. So I remember that, that uh, she supposes that um, they were imported anyway. So they were imported to Harakoto, was not, were not printed locally. Um, I remember even that she wrote that they were printed during the Yuan Dynasty and were just added into this um, into the the bureau, but but we don't know <laughs> anyway. So what we more or less sure that they are drama posters. Okay. Yeah. Would you mind send sending me the reference later? I will try. <laughs> yeah, but that is yeah, in Russian. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Brian. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot for, for all of this. And, and thank you, Nikita. I, I really enjoyed uh, yeah. the discussion. Um, so a little bit earlier in the, the chat, um, Paul had uh, noted the um, appearance of the Zhengguan Zhengyao in um, the Tongvit translations. Um, and, and his question is, you know, what did the Tongvits think of, of Tang Tai Zong, uh, which I think is an interesting question. I'm, I've been thinking about this a little bit too. I'm interested in why these texts pop up. So it's been interesting that the Lunyu is one of these that that uh, has very broad distribution and, and interest, but the Zhengguan Zhengyao also is like this. Um, are there texts that you would have expected to see in Tonga translation among these excavated sources that aren't there? So you know, we, we know there are other kinds of Tang political, you know, kind of governmental texts um, that don't seem to get translated into Tonga or Kitan. Um, were there, are there, I mean, this is, I guess, a little bit ahistorical, but are there um, gaps in what gets translated that, that struck you when you kind of look at the translation? Mm. I see. Yeah. Uh, so the problem here is that on the one hand, we have those transmitted sources that we have in Chinese histories, and we see a number of texts, as I, as I mentioned, those three texts, Xiao Jin, uh, Ar Ya, and Si Yan Zazi. But as far as I have just, just checked the, um, the catalog of collections and neither Arya and nor uh, Si Yan Zazi is preserved. I, if uh, Professor Galambus have other information, he may correct me, <laughs> but um, we only have Xiao Jin. And uh, something that we have as um, actual stuff excavated is kind of different from what we have reflect like what is reflected in um, uh, received in, in Chinese histories. I would say, so the main point of all my talk is that through the selection of those texts, we may see that what kind of texts were popular or were authoritative at that time. As I said, uh, my understanding is that they were looking, so after Li Yuanhao established uh, uh, Xia Kingdom, it kind of my, my impression that he was looking for good like tools to rule over so they to, to, to find some kind of skills and here we have uh, probably like official histories we don't I guess we don't have uh, th th yeah I don't think that we have too many Chinese histories being translated or imported except for as I mentioned Shar Guo which was a PhD dissertation of Kirill Salonin and I guess so there is a publication in Russian and in Chinese I don't know that if he I guess he didn't translate it in English and I had a look at that text and uh, this is more so I work with one of the texts which is more kind of a dialogue you know kind of anecdotes uh, um, anecdotes um, I would say 
yeah. I would see that they were just looking for so, so-called this historical analogies and looking for some kind of story, how to mm, kind of practical tools to rule over the uh, country. So I was, I had this this kind of impression. Yeah. But definitely, I mean, they tried somehow. They 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 were they admired the Tang Dynasty, absolutely. If we imagine, yeah, we, we know that like like Liao appeared before Song. And they had, you know, so they they were kind of loud, loud. They they consider they, they could consider themselves as loud. I mean, the first, um, and definitely they try to model themselves after after town. Professor, and, uh, neither, yeah. No, no, no. Please continue. Yeah, and I don't know. I mean, I mean, this is kind of my impression that I, I get. Thank again, everybody speakers, uh, participants, Professor Gold in our department again, for being so incredibly active and supportive um, and, and making this possible. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I learned a lot. There's so much that is going to end up straight in my dissertation. And if my dissertation ever comes up as a decent work, it will be also because of this. So thank you very much, everybody, for uh, participating. And let's all thank Madalena, too. Mm. Okay, I hope to see you soon, and if not, next Zoom meeting. <laughs> Bye, everybody.